questions? Um, so the uh, next talk that I'm going to give is on larynx techniques uh, of imaging, normal anatomy, and common pathology. And then after this 45-minute talk, we'll take a little break, and we'll have two talks, have lunch, two talks, take a break, and two talks, and we're done. So it should be hopefully a nice, relaxed program, and um, hopefully everybody having fun so far? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, that's good to hear. So um, these are the learning, learning objectives for the next uh, 45 minutes or so, is to talk a little bit about technique, anatomy, some tumors, inflammatory and, and infectious processes, some developmental lesions. And I'll just say a couple of brief words on vocal cord palsies just to uh, support um, and give a different perspective on what Doug mentioned. So let's talk a little bit about technique. You know, larynx, to be honest with you, is so much easier than it used to be. I remember back when I was a fellow, we'd have different protocols for different types of laryngeal pathologies. But now it's pretty simple to do. It's multi-detector imaging, whether you have a 4, 8, 16, 64 slice. Um, we always acquire everything now by 0 0.625 millimeters. Um, and we, uh, you know, it varies. Uh, sometimes 2.5, sometimes 1.25, it varies. But it is uh, a bit of cognitive dissonance uh, in the sense that if you do acquire with thin section images and then you view thick images, it's essentially what I did 20 years ago when we didn't have multi-detector imaging. And people say, well, why do you do that um, if you're going to go ahead and, and look at the thicker images? And, and really the reason is for the reformat. So the reason to do the 0 0.625 acquisition is so you can get the sagittal and coronal reformats. Um, for contrast, we use about 100 cc. Sometimes it's even less than that. We use a dual phase injection. So we give an initial 50 cc bolus, and then we wait for 90 seconds. And then we start giving another 25 to 50 cc's, and then we acquire. And the reason we do that is that when multi-detector first came out and we gave the contrast and we acquired, you know, with a 64 slice CT, we were essentially doing CTAs on everyone. The contrast is essentially still in the arterial phase. Um, and one of the uh, good things about the good old days, if, if you will, when and, you know, I can say now that I trained in the last century, I hate to say that, but... I trained in the last century, right? So when I trained in the last century, um, when we had the, the single detector imaging, by the time we acquired the images, there was enough time for the contrast to actually go into the tumor. Um, so that's one of the reasons I think many places are now doing the dual phase. And we just do quiet respiration. Uh, again, when I grew up, we would do these various maneuvers, Valsalvas, reverse Valsalvas, so on and so forth. Um, but now we just do quiet respiration. One of the reasons that I mentioned before to get the reformats was to do the uh, to, to, to do the thin section imaging was to do these reformats. So again, I grew up in the days of axial images, and it took me a while to even look at the sagittal images. But when you do do this, you know you get a very nice view of the free margin of the epiglottis. You can see the hyoid bone here in cross section. You can see the preepiglottic space, which is located here in the true vocal cords. And again, we're, we're going to go over this anatomy in gross detail. So I hope at the very least by the end of this talk you'll understand the anatomy. Um, on the coronal images, here's the free margin of the epiglottis, here's the false vocal cord, laryngeal ventricle, and then the true vocal cord. Again, this detailed um, reformats are, are really um, only can be acquired with the thin section imaging. This is just an example. Anybody want to take a uh, guess at what this? It's a cystic lesion here involving the larynx. It's extending out through the thyrohyoid membrane, very nicely seen on the coronal images and extending out into the soft tissues of the neck. Anybody want to take a guess at what this is? What is that? Laryngocele is exactly right. Excellent. So this is laryngocele. We'll, ha we'll, we'll have more to say about that. Well, what about MR? You know, MR can be used. Um, as I say, I've sort of been around circles right now. I've, you know, what's old is new, what's new is old, right? So when CT first came out, we did CT. Then all of a sudden, people discovered they could do MR. So everybody rushed to MR, and everyone started doing MR. Um, but now when I, when I go around and ask people, and I'll just do a show of hands now, I mean, how many people, when you evaluate the larynx, are primarily doing CT as your number one modality? Right. There's more than that now. You residents, you can raise your hands here. I know what you're resident. How many people are doing primarily MR? Okay, so yeah, so uh, that's pretty much what I say. Even when I was in Europe last uh, a few weeks ago, um, even the Europeans, they were one of the biggest pushers for MR. Um, even now they're doing more CT. Now having said that, when, if you do go to your meetings in the U.S., you're going to see certain institutions that still do a fair amount of MR, which is great. Um, you can do MR very nicely with three tests. So the reason we do CT is because it's quicker 
less expensive. And also, you know, I like to, when I'm choosing modalities, it's uh, if you do 100 patients, out of those 100 patients, how many are going to have diagnostic imaging studies that, that are diagnostic and not um, limited by some type of artifact? And so that reproducibility is a major factor why I like CT uh, as, as better than MR2. Because, you know, if your sequence is four minutes and after three minutes and 59 seconds the patient moves, all of a sudden your sequence is gone. So sometimes you have to be pragmatic as well. Um, as I mentioned before in the, the prior talk, the, the, the crazy thing about head and neck is that, you know, about 80% of what we see in our imaging studies, our referring physicians can either see directly by direct endoscopy or they can palpate. So I mentioned before, uh, in radiology, we're sort of programmed to um, show our worth by listing as many differential diagnoses as we can. That really doesn't translate well to head and neck imaging because the majority of what we see can be seen directly or palpated. So, for instance, this is an example of a squamous cell carcinoma. This was actually tuberculosis, and this was a paraganglioma. You know, there's really no way to distinguish between squamous cell carcinoma and tuberculosis. You know, if you see this paraganglioma and you're, you, know, you really love head and neck and you see this densely enhancing mass, yeah, maybe you can suggest that it's a tuberculosis tumor. But nine times out of ten, we really have to depend on our referring physicians and our pathologists to give us the, the final diagnosis. So our job, as you'll see, is to really talk more about the spread of the disease as opposed to given a litany of potential uh, uh, causes of the pathology that we're seeing on imaging. Well, let's talk about the anatomy. Now, the anatomy is so, so key. And if you understand the anatomy, then I think everything else falls into place. And I can assure you, when I, when I started my fellowship, in the last century. Um, I had, doesn't that sound so strange to me too, but um, when I started it uh, back in the 1990s, um, I had no clue about the larynx. I mean, I, I struggled, um, I read everything I could, um, I just didn't understand it. And then, you've probably figured out, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but one day my 30 watt light bulb went off, went off and, and everything kind of made sense to me. And I'll, hopefully I can convince that uh, to you and, and help you in your journey and un understand the larynx. But the standard anatomy for the larynx is what we've learned. It's the glottic, the superglottic, and the subglottic larynx. Um, and this is <clears throat> the anatomy of the larynx. And that 30-watt light bulb went on um, after I realized where all of this complex nomenclature of the anatomic structures of the larynx arose from. And if you start trying to shotgun the approach and name the different structures of the larynx um, without an understanding of the foundation of the larynx, you are going to be completely lost. Because I can talk to you about trichothyroid, thyroid muscle, area epiglottic fold, um, th um, thyrohyoid notch, hyoepiglottic ligament, and you're probably completely lost, right? It's, it's you know, but. What I finally figured out is that if, if you can understand four or five structures of the larynx, and the reason we don't understand those four or five structures of the larynx is because, to be honest with you, oops, we, to be honest with you, we were never taught this in medical school. And I don't know about where you all went to med school, but you know, we spent like six months on the liver and seven months, uh, you know, six weeks on the liver, and then four weeks on the leg, and a whole bunch of time on the heart, which is the heart's an important organ, of course, right? Um, a lot of time on the brain, but we just didn't study the larynx at all. And so what I realized is that if you can understand the laryngeal and the bony framework of the larynx, then everything else falls into place. So let me give you an example. So what's the name of, the, what's the name of this little bone right here that I'm contouring? The same bone that's located here. It's the hyoid bone, right? And then what's the name of this cartilaginous structure that's located here? What's that? Epiglottis, right. So first of all, the hyoid bone and the epiglottis, those are, are two of the five framework structures of the larynx. So if you have a ligament that goes from the hyoid bone to the epiglottis, what do you think you're, that the name of that ligament's going to be? Take a wild guess. Hyoepiglottic ligament, OK? That's a multisyllabic term that if you just throw out there, you're going to be completely lost. But the reason it's called the hyoepiglottic ligament is just purely based on the anatomy. You have to realize there's a hyoid bone and there's something called the epiglottis, and that's the hyoepiglottic ligament. 
So let's take that same approach and say, what's the name of this uh, a cartilaginous structure that I'm looking at right here? Arytenoid, exactly right. The arytenoid cartilage is right there. There's the arytenoid cartilage located here. So what do you call this fold of tissue, which is located here at endoscopy, that goes from the arytenoid cartilage to the epiglottis? Airy epiglottic fold, simple as that, right? So again, another multisyllabic structure that if you just threw out there, you'd be completely lost. But the reason it's called the airy epiglottic fold is because it's a fold of tissue that goes from the arytenoid to the epiglottis. What's the name of this cartilaginous structure that's located here? Thyroid cartilage, right? So what do you call the muscle that goes from the thyroid cartilage to the arytenoid cartilage? Take a wild guess. Thyroid cartilage to the arytenoid cartilage. What muscle would that be? Thyroarytenoid muscle. So the, the muscle that goes from the thyroid cartilage to the arytenoid uh, cartilage is called the thyroarytenoid muscle. And we'll see why, what landmark or, or what level that's located. What's the name of this cartilage structure that's located right here? Cricoid. The cricoid cartilage is like the foundation of your house. If you have no foundation of your house, your house is going to sink. It's just going to completely dissolve. And the cricoid cartilage is this signet-shaped uh, ring a very tough ring that, which forms the foundation of the larynx because essentially all of these structures um, are supported by the cricoid cartilage. So what do you call this joint that's located between the cricoid cartilage and the arytenoid cartilage? Cricoarytenoid joint. And we'll see the importance of identifying the cricoarytenoid joint. And what do you call, what do you think you call this membrane here that goes, this membrane right here that goes from the thyroid cartilage to the hyoid? Thyrohyoid membrane. So now we're getting pretty good at this, right? So there are five primary structures. Hyoid bone, epiglottis, thyroid cartilage, arytenoid cartilage, and cricoid cartilage, right? So now we see this ligament. This ligament is going from the, the, the thyroid cartilage to the cricoid cartilage. So what do you call that ligament then? Cricothyroid ligament or thyrocricoid ligament. Exactly right. So this is where it all gets the names from. And all of these muscles that you can see that are the, the muscular structure and the scaffolding of the larynx, again, are all derive their names from the cartilage and the bone that form the thyroid cartilage. So when we look at this, we can see that this is the endoscopy. So this is, what am I pointing at right here? I know there are ENT surgeons in here. So the radiologist, what do you think this structure is here? Epiglottis, right? What structure is this right here? Airy epiglottic fold. What are these two white glistening structures that are located here? Through vocal cord. And what's back here? Piriform sinus. This structure right here is the tongue base. And what do you think these saddlebags are here that you can see a little bit of secretions in? Bolecula, exactly right. And then this structure that goes from the um, tongue back to the uh, epiglottis is called the median glossoepiglottic fold. All right, so these are the structures that the surgeons see. And then as we come down, what we're going to do is look at the imaging correlation to what our surgeons see when they perform endoscopy. So the first thing that we'll do, again, it's all anatomy, is to talk about the normal anatomy and show you where it is on imaging and to use a little bit of pathology to highlight it. So when we look at the epiglottis, the epiglottis is an anterior and midline structure. Did everybody see the epiglottis is anterior and midline? So even when I go back to here, you can see that the epiglottis is anterior and midline. So the epiglottis is an anterior and midline structure. So if this is what the surgeons see when they perform their endoscopy. They can see this aggressive lesion involving the anterior and midline portion of the larynx. So that's a primary epiglottic carcinoma. And when we look at imaging, notice how the center of this mass is anterior and midline. So when we see a lesion that's anterior and midline, we, that has to be involving the epiglottis. Okay, now freeze that picture in your mind, and let's go to this one. Now what do we see? So in the endoscopic view, what structure am I looking at right here where the arrow is? Epiglottis. Where, now is this, is this tumor here, is this midline or is it paramidline? Paramidline, exactly right. Now, the, what's the name of that fold of tissue again that goes from the arytenoid cartilage to the epiglottis? It's called the what? 
the area epiglottic fold. Is that midline or is that paramidline? Paramidline, exactly right. So now we see this um, um, exophytic aggressive lesion that's paramidline of the larynx. Um, and now we know that it's involving what structure? Area epiglottic fold. So how do we identify that on imaging? So if you look at the image on the right, what structure am I looking at right here that's anterior and midline? What's that? Epiglottis. Now what structure am I looking at here on the left-hand side? Area epiglottic fold, exactly right. So everyone see the tumor here involving the area epiglottic fold? See how it's pyramid line? And where is this airspace that's just lateral to that? Piriform sinus, exactly right. So we have the epiglottis, the area epiglottic fold, piriform sinus. And what do you think we call the fat right here that's just anterior to the epiglottis? Area, what's that? Free epiglottic fat, that's exactly right. So all of these complex structures derive their names on this normal anatomy. And again, just to reiterate, that anatomy is the hyoid bone, the epiglottis, uh, the hyoid bone, sorry, hyoid bone, epiglottis, thyroid cartilage, arytenoid cartilage, cricoid cartilage. Now, the way that I eventually learn the anatomy is that, and I really, I make a plea to the residents and the fellows, is that um, for the next two weeks, just the next two weeks, at, the, at night before you go to bed, just take five minutes and go over those five structures for the next two weeks. And that's literally how I did it. Because once I got those five structures down, then I always remembered the anatomy of the larynx. But it takes a little work up front. But once you um, emblazon that on your brain, once it's embedded, I don't think you'll ever for forget it. So I, I, that's a little bit of homework for you. So I have two pieces of homework for you. This is homework number one. And then later on, I'll give you home homework number two, OK? OK, so there's our area epiglottic fold, all right? And again, the normal anatomy is epiglottis, area epiglottic fold. And what's this black area right here? This is the what? Yeah, so the air is the laryngeal ventricle. Now, someone stole my thunder, and we'll talk about now the false vocal cords. So what is the false vocal cords? Conceptually, this is the hardest, for me, the hardest piece of anatomy for the larynx. Because I struggled over this, and even for years, you know, even once I, tr even once I came into the new century, um, I still struggled with this. And the way that I finally conceptualized it is that the false vocal cord is essentially the inferior reflection of the area epiglottic fold. So the tip of the false vocal cord ends up attaching to the arytenoid cartilage. So that area epiglottic fold attaches to the top of the arytenoid cartilage. But this inferior reflection of the area epiglottic fold is the false vocal cord. And notice how the false vocal cord is above this airspace, which is what? What was that airspace again here? The laryngeal ventricle. So on a parasagittal view, here is the false vocal cord. The black here is the laryngeal ventricle. And what's going to be just below this? What's that? True vocal cord. So this red line indicates the level that we are at when we see the false vocal cord. So notice again, as I mentioned before, the area epiglottic fold comes down, the inferior reflection of the area epiglottic fold attaches to the arytenoid cartilage. And this identifies where the false vocal cord is. Now the key thing is, is how do we identify the false vocal cord on a cross-sectional study? Well, remember that anatomy, the area epiglottic fold comes down and attaches to the arytenoid cartilage. So when we look at a CT scan, what we look for is this. See the top of the arytenoid cartilage? When we see only the top of the arytenoid cartilage, that tells me that I'm at the level of the false vocal cord. Now compare this appearance with this appearance. Do we see any cartilage here? No, not at all. But now when we come to this level, then we can see the top of the arytenoid cartilage. So if I'm at the larynx and I can see the top of the arytenoid cartilage, then I know I'm at the level of the false vocal cord. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah, okay. That's the hardest thing. If you got that, everything for me in the larynx is easier because now we're at the level of the true vocal cord. And the true vocal cord is very, very easy to see because we can see the cricoid cartilage and the arytenoid cartilage. So we're at the level of the cricoarytenoid cartilage. So what does this look like on imaging? Well, here's a schematic illustration demonstrating the cricoid cartilage 
and the arytenoid cartilage and this little tumor here involving the true vocal cord. So when you see the cricoarytenoid joint, you know you're at the level of the true vocal cord. And here's a schematic illustration of a verrucous carcinoma involving the true vocal cord. And here's the cricoid cartilage and the arytenoid cartilage and the cricoarytenoid joint. That tells us where the true vocal cord is. So just to reiterate again, area epiglottic fold, there's no pieces of cartilage. False vocal cord, we get the top of the arytenoid cartilage. And then true vocal cord, we can see the cricoarytenoid joint. Does that make sense to everyone? And finally, the subglottis. The subglottis is formed by the signet ring cricoid cartilage. So when you look at the subglottis, essentially what you look for is the big O, the formation of the signet ring. So there's no cricoarytenoid joint. You just see the signet ring. And when you see the signet ring, you know you're at the level of the subglottis. So in the parasagittal images, here's the undersurface of the true vocal cord. And this airway that we're looking at right, right here is the cricoid cartilage. In fact, there is a part of the signet ring of the cricoid cartilage here. In fact, with the leap of faith, you can see the cricoarytenoid joint on the sagittal images. Here is the um, shoulder-shaped appearance of the subglottis. Here is the false vocal cord, laryngeal ventricle, true vocal cord, and now here is the subglottis. And this is a, a, a pathologic section of a primary subglottic carcinoma. And here is aggressive appearance here of a primary subglottic carcinoma. So once you get below and you see the signet ring, then you know you're at the level of the subglottis. Does that make sense to everyone? All right. Again, it's anatomy, anatomy, anatomy. And then, again, I'll make my pleas to my the residents and the fellows in the audience. The fellows, I see where you're sitting. I see Nick. I see Lewis. I see Sam, right? I'm going to come bug you guys next week to, to, to uh, ask you about the laryngeal anatomy, right? I can still do that because you're still fellows, right? Is that right? Okay. Right. So let's go ahead and move on now to tumors in, involving the, um, the larynx. So... You know, the, number one, by far and away, it's going to be squamous cell carcinoma. And I showed in the previous portion of the talk the squamous cell carcinoma. But here's a type of tumor that's located here. You can see a, a, this lesion looks like it's primarily involving from the, cricoid cart, from the cricoid cartilage. Maybe there's some rings and circles in here. Endoscopically, the surgeons look down and they see a very, very rock hard mass. So, what do you think the primary diagnosis is going to be here? That's exactly right. So this should be, there you go, there's the chondrosarcoma. So when we look at the bone algorithms, we can see that there is a lot of, uh, this lesion is primarily arising from the cricoid cartilage. It's a submucosal lesion. It's very rock hard. And this is a chondrosarcoma. Now, this is a minor salivary gland tumor. Remember the definition of minor salivary gland tumor. A minor salivary gland tumor is, is taking salivary gland tissue and transposing it into a part of the head and neck in which there should be no native salivary gland. So as a result, this can occur anywhere. So remember, the we talked about an anatomically based differential diagnosis. And essentially, the anatomy of the head and neck is similar to the anatomy everywhere else in the body. But the one type of tumor that's somewhat unique to the head and neck is the minor salivary gland lesions. And remember, the most common benign ones were what? Wortham's tumors, and what was the other one? Anybody? Those were two. Pleomorphic adenoma, and then what were the two malignant ones? It was muc epidermoid, and what was the other one? Adenoid cystic carcinoma. Now, there are other different subtypes or other type of um, salivary gland tumors that can arise, but those, if you will, are the big four. So minor salivary gland tumors have the exact same appearance of squamous cell carcinoma. So number one, if you see something like this, you probably should say squamous cell carcinoma. And then the pathologist can tell you that you're wrong, and you can say, you're right, I was wrong, thank you very much. But number one, it should be squamous cell carcinoma. And this is just another example. This was happened to be a mucoepidermoid carcinoma involving the trachea. And here on the axial images, we can see narrowing of the normal lumen of the trachea by this mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Again, imaging findings are completely not, un, not distinguishable indistinguishable, I should say, from squamous cell carcinoma, except for this one. This was an interesting case I saw many years ago. This was a uh, benign, uh, this was actually a pleomorphic adenoma involving the tongue base. The key thing here is on the gradient echo image, it was very high signal. 
So I have seen a couple of these. This is, happens to be a, a pleomorphic adenoma involving the tongue base, again, a minor salivary gland tumor. And the distinguishing feature was the high signal on the gradient echo and the TT weighted image. But again, extremely rare. Now, this is a bizarre tumor. Um, this is a granular cell tumor. And a, a granular cell tumor is a tumor that arises in the larynx. And typically, we don't image these. But my, my ENT colleagues, and I have this, uh, some ENTs in the back there. You can tell me if I'm right or wrong. Um, the people that I've worked in the, in the past say they see this you know, relatively frequently. But what they end up doing is they see them pretty early, and they continue to shave it off. Um, but what happens with some of these granular cell tumors is that the surgeons will go in and shave it off. But these things tend to have an infiltrative or endophytic growth pattern. So by the time that we see it, everything that's involving the airway oftentimes has been shaved off. And we end up seeing these as these tumors that extend through the larynx, and in this case, extending on the undersurface of the strap muscle. So if I see something that looks like this, then I start thinking that this is a granular cell tumor. So this is a, a, a non-contrast T1-weighted MR and a contrast-enhanced T1-weighted MR, again, demonstrating this type of growth pattern. So if I see something like this, it almost has a circumferential and primarily anterior in the larynx, and I start thinking of a granular cell tumor. This is the classic example of a little subglottic hemangioma. So, you know, we tend not to image this uh, very frequently. Oftentimes, the pediatric otolaryngologists will tell me they'll go ahead and see them. And if they're not obstructing the airway, sometimes we can just resolve. But if we do see these on imaging, they're typically located in the subglottic larynx. We can see dense enhancement. In this case, we can see a little bit of compression of the airway on the axial and the sagittal images. Again, the characteristic findings and the features that we look for is that typically in a child, oftentimes a newborn with a little bit of strider. Um, and when we do the imaging study, we can see this dense uh, enhancement uh, within the subglottic hemangioma. Well, let's go on to infectious and in inflammatory processes. Now, um, you know, Wegner's granulomatosis is the, is the old term for Wegner's. It now has a new term. Again, being born in the last century, I still use the term Wegner's granulomatosis. So Wegner's is a granulomatous vasculitis. It's primarily immune-mediated. And it has classic forms. And the classic forms are necrotizing granuloma of the upper and lower uh, respiratory tracts. It's associated with a systemic vasculitis. And it can also result in this necrotizing glomerulonephritis involving the kidneys. Now, the laryngeal involvement in Wegner's typically is subglottis and results in a narrowing or stenosis. And the patients usually have a sore throat, laryngitis, or fevers. Now, in the head and neck, Wegner's is pretty rare involving the larynx. But really, where it's more common is in the sinuses. And I think we'll probably talk more about that later today. Um, so I'll give you my impression about when I think of Wegner's in the sinuses. But just realize Wegner's does arise in the larynx, and it's pretty rare. But again, it's, it's nonspecific. So this was past proven Wegner's granulomatosis. And again, what, by the way, what level are we at right now? Someone tell me, are we at the? Uh, Subglottic. You see how easy head and neck is? We're subglottic. Why? Because we can see the signet ring of the cricoid cartilage. So now we're in the subglottic area. So when you see the subglottic area, you can see that this circumferential lesion in involving the uh, larynx. Now, could this be squamous cell carcinoma? Absolutely. Could this be minor salivary gland? Absolutely. Could this be granular cell tumor? Absolutely. Could it be Wegner's? That's what it turned out to be. So unfortunately, a lot of these things that we see are nonspecific. So we just have to keep this in the back of our minds. Another example, Wegner's non-contrast T1-weighted images. With contrast, we can see diffuse enhancement in these patients with Wegner's granulomatosis. Well, here's, a, a, again, a, a pretty rare case. Uh, this was a case years ago, but one of the few cases where we saw a little abscess involving the free margin of the epiglottis. So, could this be a little cyst involved in the epiglottis? Absolutely. But this patient had a very severe fever, um, a very bad sore throat. We did our CT scan, and there's a little abscess right here involved on the free margin of the epiglottis. Now, uh, the next stage, if you will, in adults is this concept of supraglottitis. Now, in kids, um, what do we call this? In the kids, you, we typically look for epiglottitis. 
but the, if you will, the adult form of, super, of epiglottitis is supraglottitis. And these patients typically present with a fever, sore throat, dysphagia, uh, odonophagia, muffled voice, and drooling. The pathology can be bacterial or potentially viral as well, but in most cases it's bacterial. And the treatment is airway management and antibiotics. So this is an example of supraglottitis. And it looks pretty ugly, right? You look at this and you say, you've got to be kidding me. Um, but what we can look at this is we can identify the normal structures if we just understand what the anatomy is. So let's take a look. What structure am I looking at right here? Hyoid bone, exactly. So hyoid bone, we come back and we see this structure right here is this anterior and midline. So what structure is this? Epiglottis. We come back here and now we see the structure back here and back here. So what, you don't see it as well on this side. But what structure am I looking at right here? Very epiglottic fold. And what structure is right back here where my arrow is? Piriform sinus. And what do we see here? This is the posterior laryngeal wall or the posterior pharyngeal wall. So once you... Excuse me, once you understand the anatomy, then you can understand what the imaging findings are of supraglottitis. So there's diffuse enlargement and swelling of the epiglottis, the airy epiglottic fold, and if we get down to the false vocal cord, the false vocal cord. There's diffuse thickening and enhancement of the mucosa. In this case, there was no obliteration of the preepiglottic fat, but sometimes you can see that. You can see a lot of edema involving the retropharyngeal space, which is back here, right behind the pharynx. And we can see reticulation and thickening of the platysmal muscle. So here's our platysmal muscle here, and this is way too thick. So this has a very aggressive inflammatory appearance to it. So this is supraglottitis. And this just tells us that there are different stages of infections that it can involve not only the neck, but everywhere else in the body. So this classification is ubiquitous. So erysipelas is just an infection of the superficial layers of the skin. A cellulitis is an infection of the subcutaneous tissues. Necrotizing fasciitis, as we'll see, is destruction of the fascia without skin or muscle necrosis. And then a myositis is involvement of the muscles. So what's necrotizing fasciitis? Now, everyone has heard of this. And in fact, it's, it's always fascinating to me. There's a typically... Um, increased awareness of necrotizing fasciitis about every seven years because, you know, Doug's from New York, right? And anytime there's an article in the New York Times, the whole population becomes aware of this. So what's the other name for necrotizing fasciitis when it hits the New York Times? Anybody remember that? Yeah, yeah it's flesh-eating bacteria. So it's the old flesh-eating bacteria. Then all of a sudden, there's, there's an outbreak of flesh-eating bacteria. So that's, that is necrotizing fasciitis. Now, granted, it's a very severe disease affects the elderly and the immunocompromised with a mortality rate of up to 75%. So this is necrotizing fasciitis. Now the challenge is here is what is the, what is the characteristic finding that tells us it's necrotizing fasciitis? Here we can see thickening of the area of glottic fold, thickening of the posterior uh, laryngeal wall, uh, edema involving the retropharyngeal space. But what's the characteristic finding that tells us it's necrotizing fasciitis? Is air, right. So if you have a patient that's really sick and they've never had radiation or chemotherapy and they haven't had a major coughing spell, because occasionally if someone coughs really, really hard, they can blow a little bronchus or something and the air can involve the base of the neck. Uh, but if, you, if, if you've never had someone that's had recent surgery, a big coughing spell, or has ever had chemotherapy or radiation therapy, which is the majority of patients we're going to see, if you see this air in the neck in a pretty sick patient, then you have to consider the diagnosis of necrotizing fasciitis. This, on the other hand, is a patient that underwent chemotherapy and radiation therapy, and here is air in the neck, but this is due to chondronecrosis. So if you have a patient treated with combined therapy, you can actually have gas forming in the soft tissues when you develop necrosis of the cartilage following this type of treatment. Well, the next couple things that we'll talk about, then we'll take our break, is a, a little bit of the developmental lesion. The thyroid gland starts at the tongue base, and it starts at a specific portion of the tongue base. Now, does anybody remember the, the specific foramen where the thyroid um, uh, uh, is, originates or is born? It's the foramen cecum, right. 
So the thyroid gland begins at the foramen cecum, and it has, if you will, a relative descent. And I say relative descent because sometimes the embryologists are not sure whether the thyroid gland falls or the neck grows superiorly, which kind of drags it down. So at times it's debatable. But the thyroid gland starts at the foramen cecum and has this relative descent to the anterior portion of the neck. And it always gets a little bit confusing as opposed to what's lingual thyroid versus what's thyroglossal duct cyst. So the way I try to explain it is that obviously both of these are related. They're, they're, they, they are related. They're like first cousins, right? So if you have solid tissue that's located at the tongue base, and any time that you have residual thyroid solid tissue, that's what's referred to as a lingual thyroid. So this is an example of a lingual thyroid that's located right, you would, right where you would expect the foramen cecum to be. And here we can see it's densely enhancing. It looks like there may have a little bit of calcification or, or, uh, within it. And this is lingual thyroid. And when we do a CT scan at the level of where the thyroid should be, we can see that the thyroid is not present. So that's classic lingual thyroid. Another example, a patient non-contrast T, uh, T2, non-contrast T1 with enhancement, another example of lingual thyroid. And again, based on that alone, to be honest with you, I'd probably call that a squamous cell carcinoma. But on the other hand, if the patient is hypothyroid um, and doesn't have any thyroid seen on ultrasound, then you have to keep in the back of your mind that this, in fact, may be a lingual thyroid. You can do the nuclear medicine studies, as seen here. In this case, here's the sagittal images of a lingual thyroid, and this is the uh, radioiodine study. We can see there's uptake within the lingual thyroid gland. So that's lingual. That's the lingual thyroid. A any place where there's solid thyroid tissue, that's a lingual thyroid. So, as Doug mentioned, the thyroid gland starts at the foramen cecum, and as it descends inferiorly, it has this. Uh, I always call it a complex relationship with the hyoid bone until it ends at the anterior neck. Now, there was a question earlier about how do we look at the thyroid gland and what are the distinguishing features? Well, at least in my experience, you know, the thyroid, uh, the um, thyroglossal duct cysts, as we've seen here, can either be unilocular or multilocular. They can be midline or paramidline. And I've seen them superficial or deep to the hyoid bone. And the reason you have that is because of this relationship right here with the hyoid bone. But the, the feature that always helped me, and I'm glad Doug mentioned this before too, is that the thyroid, the, the, the thyroglossal duct cyst is embedded in the scrap metal. So if you see a unilocular or multilocular mass, midline or paramidline that's in the scrap muscle, then that is a thyroglossal duct cyst. And the reason is, if, you know, we're, we do a lot of adult imaging, right? You know, the pediatric ENT surgeons and the, our pediatric radiologists, they obviously do more ultrasound. But the way you distinguish a kid with a thyroidosal duct cyst is they come in with an anterior neck mass and they swallow, and it moves up and down. And the reason it moves up and down is because it's in the strap muscles. And what do the strap muscles do? The strap muscles are like the cables in an elevator. So when you swallow, the strap muscles are located anterior to the larynx. They're attached to it, and they contract. And they pull the larynx up. And they pull the larynx up towards the tongue base so the epiglottis can flop down so all your food doesn't go through the larynx. But it's that contraction of the strap muscle that causes the larynx to move. So similarly, if you have an anterior neck mass and it's embedded in the strap muscle, clinically, you're going to see movement when the patient swallows. I think the fancy term is movement with deglutination. So that's the radiological correlate of how thyroglossal duct cysts are, are made clinically. So that's why that key feature is that em embedding within the strap muscle. Um, Doug mentioned before, this is the classic cyst-strung procedure. When they perform the cyst-strung procedure, the surgeons have to go in and take a cuff of the tongue base because they want to make sure that they know the thyroid gland originates at the foramen cecum. So they need to take that superior cuff of tissue so there's no residual disease. So what is a laryngocele? You know, a laryngocele is dilatation of the laryngeal ventricle. And if the laryngocele is limited laterally by the thyrohyoid membrane, then this is referred to as an internal or a simple laryngocele. 
But if it extends outside the thyrohyoid membrane into the neck, then this is referred to as a complex um, laryngocele. And it's a key differentiator because if the laryngocele is located within the larynx, this can be removed through an endoscopic approach. But however, if the laryngocele extends outside the thyrohyoid membrane into the soft tissue, then this oftentimes require, requires a cervical approach. So again, that's how we can, we can make our value. Another example of a laryngocele, they can be air filled as is seen here, another one here, and, a, and another one here, just outside. I am going to go back real quick because one thing about laryngoceles is that, again, when I grew up, laryngoceles were most commonly seen in glass blowers and trumpet players, right? Anybody remember Dizzy Gillespie when he would blow into his flugelhorn? You see these big things come out? Yeah, those are big laryngoceles, right? But the most common cause of laryngoceles is actually squamous cell carcinoma. So anytime that you see a laryngoceles, you have to look for an obstruction, obstructing lesion that can either be a tumor involved in the true vocal cord or the false vocal cord. This is a laryngocele that became infected. This is a laryngopiocele. Again, it has a similar appearance to the laryngocele, but clinically you can make the diagnosis. We can also see all of this reticulation of the fat surrounding the laryngocele. Um, this was just an example of an arteriovenous malformation that's involving the floor of the mouth. But uh, when we take a look at the larynx, we can see that when we take a, this is a non-contrast T1 weighted image. You can see these flow voids, but when we do a CTA, look at this dense enhancement right here. This is all arteriovenous malformation involving the larynx. And when we do an MRV, here we can see uh, a diffuse enhancing lesions on this M uh, MRA, I should say, involving the larynx. The last thing that I'll just briefly mention is vocal cord palsy. And Doug already talked eloquently about the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Um, the only couple points I'll make about vocal cord palsy is it can be a little tricky. Um, realize that uh, in chronic vocal cord palsies, you're going to have asymmetrical dilatation of the laryngeal ventricle. Um, he talked about the recurrent laryngeal nerve going from top to bottom. The only couple points that I wanted to make was if you look at a CT scan, you can potentially determine whether it's chronic or acute. This is the normal appearance of the uh, Larynx, when someone tell me, what level are we at right now? So what, so again, let's not, let's figure out what cartilage are we looking at here? Cricoid. Do we see the arytenoid cartilage? No arytenoid cartilage. So which, what level of, of the, of the uh, larynx are we at then? Subglottic larynx, exactly right. So here we're at the level of the subglottic larynx and realize that there are these constrictor muscles posterior to it. So one way that we can identify that we're looking at chronic denervation atrophy is that these muscles do get some of their branches from the vagus nerve. So here's a normal attenuation of the muscle on the left-hand side, and we can see that on the right-hand side, all that fat is obliterated. So if we do have a patient that comes in with a vocal cord palsy and someone asks you how long is it chronic or is it acute, one way to look at it is to look for the adjacent muscle just posterior to the cricoid cartilage. And the other way that we can look at it too is to look for the little fat right here involving the left side of, of, the, of the larynx. So here's the normal appearance here um, of the, uh, again, right at the level of subglottis. But notice how the muscles here are, uh, are, are atrophic. And in this case, it was due to this bronchogenic carcinoma that's clipping the recurrent vocal cord, uh, recurrent uh, laryngeal nerve that we illustrated before. And if a patient does have a vocal cord palsy, then the surgeons can perform some type of medialization procedure. This can be confusing if you're not used to seeing it. This patient had a left vocal cord palsy, and this was injection of Teflon. So in this particular case, the surgeons went ahead and put Teflon in with medialization of the left vocal cord. And in this case, this was a Teflon uh, granuloma here that was injected. And what we see is that this patient had a left vocal cord palsy. So in order to try to medialize that, so this, this vocal cord is normally moving. But you can see if it moves, it cannot close the airway because this vocal cord is paretic. So what the surgeons can do is take a little bit of Teflon or silicon or whatever. They move this vocal cord medially so this normally moving vocal cord can oppose itself and cause uh, the sound to occur. 
But in this case, unfortunately, this patient developed a large Teflon um, granuloma after the Teflon was in, uh, injected. So one of the potential complications that you may see. So in summary, what we've tried to do over the last 45 minutes or so is talk a little bit about the technique. And remember your homework, right? Homework, homework, homework. It's look at the normal cartilages and the bones of the larynx. If you do that for five minutes in the evening over the next two weeks, I don't think you'll ever have a problem with the normal anatomy. We talked a little bit about the tumors, um, infectious and inflammatory process, developmental, and just a little bit about the vocal cord palsies as well. So thank you very much for your attention.